Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, episode number 40, Making History with Milo Hansen. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hello, fellow hunters. This is Carrie Zilka from the Wild World of Carrie Z podcast. You know, I don't always listen to other hunting podcasts, but when I do, I listen to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck podcast. Stay hunting, my friends. In three, two, one, go. This is Dusty Phillips from Chubby Tines Outdoors. This is Jay Scott from the Big Buck Registry. You guys need to get pumped up. We have an awesome, awesome podcast. This is the show of all shows. This is a show of a lifetime. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that we can top this, and no disrespect to any of our other guests that we've ever had on before. But there's only one person in this entire world that currently holds the world record buck. The world record typical whitetail, yes. Boone and Crockett. Right. It's not the fattest chubby tine buck you've ever seen. It's not the biggest buck on the big buck registry that you've ever seen. No. Nope. But it is the most perfect, widest racked, number one inch, most symmetrical buck you will ever see, most likely. In the world. In, your wor- in the world at this in time. World. Probably in your lifetime. The Hanson Buck. The Hanson Buck. We are about to interview Milo Hanson. Milo Hanson is going to speak with us, and to if any, anybody that wants to listen to this, he agreed. He agreed to talk to us and share that story from 1993 when he shot the world record buck. How, how could you not be pumped up to listen to this podcast right now? you got to be pumped. It's a legend. Dusty, it is a legend of <laughs> it's legends. A, it's a dream of mine. It, if anybody else could have joined us on a podcast, it would be Milo Hansen. And, he, and he's joining us tonight. Right. Like, if you could just pick one person, that would be the dream interview. Well, I did. It was Milo Hansen. Milo Hansen. We got him. And we got and him. We got him on the show, you know? Right. We're, we're pumped up. I hope you all are pumped up out there, the listeners. Cause Milo Hansen right. is about to get on the podcast with us. I'm pumped up. Dusty's pumped up. And I want you to be pumped up, too, because we're bringing Milo Hansen to you right now to listen to the story as retold by Milo Hansen himself from November 23rd, 1993, to hang a world record buck on his wall in his trophy room forever. 213 and 5 eighths inches. Unbelievable. World record typical whitetail. Unbelievable. Let's call him up, Jay. Let's get him. I'm just out of my skin ready for this. Let's do this. Let's just do this. Let's do it. I'm so pumped. Let's go. All right. How are things in Saskatchewan these days? Well, we're warmed up. Well, it's still a little chilly, but not bad at all. No slowly going, and winter's going to be done pretty soon. Awesome. Now, what's cold to you? What's cold? Well, today is in the minuses, you know, so. (laughs) And that's in Celsius, so we'd be like, I think in the morning, minus 11, 12, and then during the day, we're probably minus 3 or 4. Gotcha. We're supposed to be that way this week, and then next week starting up to warm up above zero, you know, which is 32. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> We're complaining about 47, so uh, you've, you've got a oh, little, yeah. little thicker than we do. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for joining us, Milo. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And no problem. We'd, uh, we've got a bunch of stuff we'd like to cover. I don't know if you'd be up for going back in time a little bit and telling us a little story. Sure. Awesome. Um, Name of the game. Exactly. Um, you you hold the record for the most perfect big whitetail in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so far. So far. <laughs> yeah, the, world, the world record typical. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, Milo, where are you located right now? I'm in bigger, I'm on a farm in bigger Saskatchewan, Canada. We're towards the western part of Saskatchewan and partway up to the north from the border of Montana. 
This winter, we were one of the coldest winters. We were in the minus 30 to 40 with the wow. wind chills. Wow. Some wind chills were up to minus 50. No wow. kidding. What does that do to your deer population? Uh, it's hard on the deer population. Uh, last winter, we had a real hard winter with lots of snow. And in this area, we lost probably 50 to 60 percent of our whitetail deer. No kidding. That's insane. I, I just can't even imagine that. I saw a picture on your Facebook page. You had a picture of a bunch of does walking around. Was that recent or was that um, earlier? That was year? last winter. Yeah. Last winter. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. We had about 40 of them living in our yard. <clears throat> That's crazy. Yeah. So, well, uh, we fed them over here, threw out some bales out and yeah. the bin doors were open and some of the deer stayed around our house even for protection from, uh, I think, uh, predators, you know. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. They, they, they're yeah. smart. We they're... have no outside dogs, so, yeah, they right. That makes sense. around the house. Deer are smart when they figured that kind of yeah. stuff out. So oh, you, for sure, yeah. So you're in Bigger, uh, Saskatchewan. And... You know, I, I, yeah. I got to say, gotta say something about Bigger. You know, if you roll in the Bigger, you're going to see a sign that says, New York is big, but this is Bigger. You recall any of them signs out there, Milo? Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah. That sign is really famous. Um, yeah, for sure. And it's been there for a long, long time. That's very cool. Now, Milo, yeah. you were born in Canada. I was born in Canada. I was born in uh, the western part of Saskatchewan, uh, probably uh, uh, three and a half hour drive uh, north or south of me right now, down yeah. along the Frenchman River. Gotcha. And how? What? You, what year were you born? Nineteen ninety four. So. Getting to be an old guy. Gotcha. And you're are you married? I'm married, yeah. Got one son, he's forty three years old, and I got two grandsons, one thirteen and one ten. Yeah. And what's uh, what's your wife's name? Olive. Olive. Excellent. Um and uh from what I understand, Olive it's Olive's farm, I believe, correct? Is that the farm you moved to? Yeah, it was uh, Olive's uh, mother and dad's farm we moved on to, yeah. Very cool. Now, Milo, the, I'd like to go back, if we could, um, sure. to you moved to Bigger in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yeah, 1969. 1969. What was life back? Yeah. What was life like back in 1969 in, in Bigger, Saskatchewan? Yeah, I'll tell you. When I first married all of them, we came up here hunting. We actually didn't have any deer right around here. We had to go farther north. And the deer filled in, filled in, and migrated in just like the moose we have here now. And, yeah. I got, I got to ask, did the deer population, did it increase with the livestock sales in 1970 uh, being on the uh, decline? Oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. No, our deer population got, uh, we had, you know, good numbers, eh? Good ratios, and uh, they were good right up to the last couple of years. We had the hard winter in 2013, killed off, you know, 50 to 60 percent of the whitetail. Mule deer seemed to, you know, handle it okay, and I mean, there were some of them died off, and the moose handled it okay. Gotcha, Milo. You've have you been working on a farm your whole life, or have you done other things? I did other things. Yeah, when I first got out of school, I worked on oil rigs, <clears throat> and then when I married Olive, we, uh, we I worked at the co-op, and then I went to another small town and was the lumber manager there, and then from the lumber manager, I went to the general manager. And then in 1968, all of dad died. Mm -hmm. So we moved back actually just at the end of 1968, and we started farming. Our first year was 1969, and we've been here ever since. That's awesome. Uh, you've been deer hunting your whole life uh, as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, grew up on a, you know, I'm from a farm down in the southwest of uh, Saskatchewan, and I mean, that's what you did. You walked all over with a shotgun and shooting rabbits and birds and then you went to deer hunting with your dad and your grandpa. And, yeah. Who would you say was the person that taught you how to hunt? Well, it'd be my dad for sure. Yeah, yeah. And my grandpa. I used to camp. He had a he had a little farm down on the flat, and we would camp down along the river, and uh, we would hunt uh, uh, like bush rabbits to eat, and you know, cook them out there and sleep in the tent. And so it started there, you know, with yeah. a little twenty-two uh, shorts. And, and I hunted, you know, deer with my dad. That's very cool. What, can you recall any of the little tips or tricks that he taught you along the way? Uh, probably patience is the biggest thing. You know, you need patience to be able to hunt deer. Yeah, uh, that's a, gr that's that a great the main tip. thing, you know. And my dad was a really patient man. That's a, that's a beautiful tip. I couldn't agree with that more. I'd like to go back a little bit, Milo, and uh, to – Almost like a time machine. I'd like you to take us back to 1993. 
if you could. Sure. Yeah. So you're, you've you moved to the farm in nineteen six or yeah nineteen sixty nine, and yeah. and then you fast forward a few years, thirty years or so, um, and you're working on hunting whitetail uh, out there on the big farm that you moved to. And how did you first be get introduced to the world record buck that you eventually shot? Yeah, actually, in 1993, uh, our bus driver, Jim, Jim Angelopez, actually seen him with a bus, bus route, and they actually stopped one day and looked at him in the field. Eh? And then a few other guys had seen him, and they all talked about this giant, you know, um, they said like a baby, like an elk or something like that. So 1993, we actually went out looking for him, and I was with a group, you know, I wasn't by myself. <clears throat> and we hunted him for the whole week. And a couple of times during that week, uh, Walter Meager seen him, but we had no fresh tracks. And it was like, uh, you know, a lot of uh, deer tracks all over, so you couldn't track up on him. And we're in rolling land with uh, 20 to 30% of land is low parts with willows and astens or poplars. Yep. So we hunted him right through the whole week. And the next week uh, we hunted. I didn't take go out hunting Monday because I had to catch up on a bunch of my farm work. Those guys went out and there was no success. And then Monday night it turned cold and started to snow. We decided where we were, we were going to meet up. When, when when John picked me up and we went to where Walter and Rennie were, we seen their eyes were just bulged right out. And they said they had seen him and he was down in this uh, probably 20, 30 acre willow run. And they were pretty good on a high advantage point and they said he hadn't came out. So uh, actually we formed a drive and I was on the north end and uh, we split up, you know, guys on both sides and Rennie <clears throat> walked through the center of it. And it's just by luck that he came out because we walked that before and the buck will just go around you and stay in there because it's heavy enough, you know. But he, he came out and that's the first time I seen him. And the other the three guys shot at him but missed. But when I seen him going, I mean, yeah, he looked like this baby elk that everybody was talking about. A baby elk. Yeah, or an elk, you know. <laughs> that's what they were describing him as, the, the baby elk. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, a, that's a unique deer right there when they're calling it the baby elk. Yeah. So some of yeah. your some of your buddies had seen or had glimpses of the buck at this point. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, Walter had seen it a couple times. Now, who is Walter? Tell uh, me more. I seen it, but then when we tried to follow up on it, you know, we lost his tracks because yeah. there were so many deer tracks. And, gotcha. Who is Walter? Tell me, about, t- out. tell me about your hunting party that you were with. Yeah, I was with Walter Meager. We've been friends ever since I came up here. Rennie Agini and uh, John Oroshko, which is our neighbor just over here. These are all neighbors right around okay. here, right? Eh? And those uh, guys that, that you hunt with, do they farm as well? Or do they? Have, what else do they do? Yeah, three guys farm, and the other guy works for a farmer, yeah. Okay, so it's a farming community where you're at. in the. Oh, for sure, yeah. Uh, farming and cattle and stuff, yeah. So, but anyway, after we spooked him out the first time, he went into where this feeding area was. Uh, there had been a lot of deer tracks overnight, even though there was fresh snow. Mm-hmm. And we lost him for a while, and by accident, we spooked him out of his other bluffs. And then he went across and went onto my land. And we drove up there and made another drive. And this time when he came out, he came out on my side. And, well, actually, John Oroshka was with me, and we were standing there, and we both shot, and... I mean, we just couldn't believe the size of him. He just looked, his horns just looked oversized for the body. He was only probably a 200-pound deer. Interesting. And he ran into another bluff. We made another drive, and this time he came out on my side, and I made the shot. And he, I hit the top of his back, and there was fur flying off the top of his back. Okay. And part of that bullet split apart and ended up in that uh, hat right antler, right? Eh? Oh, no kidding. He so. went into another bluff. I ran up there, and I could see him, and I shot him in the shoulder. And he went down. And then I went up there, and he was still alive, so I shot him in the neck. And uh, then I started shaking because, you know, my legs are 29 inches, and that's what his outside, outside spread is 29 inches. So. Wow, wow. There was no ground shrink. No kidding. So you were on this push, basically, and and then yeah, yeah. the the buck just happened to come out where, where you had some good shooting lanes. Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he could have went out any side, or it yeah. was just my day. Eh? How far away yeah. was he when you first shot? Probably 100 yards, something like that, running. Okay. And so you saw the, the hair come flying off the back. I did, yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah. I I thought it was steam coming off the back, but it was cutting that hair, and it did <laughs> hit some of the rib bones as it went, like, you know. Oh, wow. wow. And he stumbled down on that because part of the lead went into the horn, and he caught up, and then he went into that other bluff, eh? Wow. So uh, when the bullet hit, it split, and some went into the horn, and 
Some took yeah. some of the hair off. Wow. Yeah, that lead is still in the horn there, eh? Oh, wow. interesting. That's awesome. Yeah, it should have blew off, but it, uh, we didn't even notice it right away until we brought it home, and it wasn't cracked, but as it dried out, it, it developed a crack in the okay. great antler, eh? Gotcha. Right, that, that, that's Bugzilla if he can take a, a lead in the antler. Yeah, yeah. But actually, that deer, our neighbor boy, actually had a hunt on him on Monday. He got married actually on Saturday, and he was going to go on his honeymoon. Yep. And during Sunday night, his sister seen it, and so she told him about it. So he went out there, and he he and he uh, seen where it was, so he had to go get a friend to help him push it out. Yeah. And he did empty his clip, and it ran away, and then he went on his honeymoon. When he came back, he came over and looked at it, and he said, yeah, that's the one I saw that. <laughs> wow. did, did he hit it at all? <laughs> no, he didn't. No, no. Gotcha. Do you remember what day of the week it was that you were hunting? Uh, yeah, it was Tuesday that I got him. Tuesday, and it was tu- yeah. Tuesday, November 15th, 1993. No, ne- no. November 23rd. November 23rd, 1993. Yeah. That was the kill day. Gotcha. And, um, yeah. You had seen him, right, on, uh, I think it was on November 15th, as I recall, reading a story about it one time. Yeah, well, Walter had seen him. Walter had seen him. Because we hunted that first week, whatever day gotcha. that is. And Walter had seen him, I think, uh, on Thursday of that week. Eh? Thir- so Thursday, the w- weekend went by. He, the, yeah. The buck had had a clip unloaded on him at some point in previous, previous to that. And then mm-hmm. on, on a Tuesday, November 23rd, 1993, was the day that you harvested what appeared did, to be yeah. a baby elk. It turns out to be the yeah. world, world record buck. Yeah. Amazing. And, you know, that's the only deer I've shot that didn't have no ground shrink. I mean, his horns right. just look bigger when you're beside him, eh? Right. Wow. Tell, tell and, us You know, I that. hadn't had a cigarette for three years, and when I came out of the bush, <laughs> one of the guys smoked there and said, give me a cigarette. Right. Easier, man, but. So, so <laughs> you, 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 you see the deer, and, and you're shaking like a, a leaf. And you're trying. Oh, you want to believe it? You're trying to put the cigarette in your mouth for the first cigarette yeah. you've had in three years. How did yeah. that, how did that go? How did each puff go? Oh, not good. I mean, yeah, you know what? It, if you haven't had smoke for three years, and you know, it, it yeah, it's not good. But yeah. anyway, it maybe settled my nerves down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, I could only imagine the the feeling you had. Uh, when yeah. you shot that, when you when you harvest that buck, Milo, it had to be awesome. Tell tell us about oh, what, awesome, what, yeah. how how pumped up were you when you seen how big he really was? Oh, big time! Like that's why I said I was just shaking, you know, like right. ma- major shaking. Like you know, if I'd have been shaking like that when I was shooting that, I'd have never gotten him. Eh? Mm. All right, uh, that's awesome. Uh, what, tell us a little yeah. bit about about your about your hunting gear in nineteen ninety three. What did you have on while you was hunting? Uh, actually, they were just uh, coveralls, um, you know, white coveralls. I bought it in the clouds. And my rifle was a 308 uh, uh, Winchester Model 88 with a Weaver 4K scope. Yeah. And I bought that gun and scope in uh, in the 70s for $169. You said it was a four-power scope? Four, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It was just one, that like, four-power. That was it. Yeah, it was just a a standard four-power scope. And you said said a 308 and an 88 series, uh, that's a lever action, ain't it? That's a lever action, yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow, that's that. That just makes it that much more cooler that you shot it with a lever action yeah. rifle. That, that's awesome. Yeah, actually, I still got the gun, and a guy from Pennsylvania, Dane Hawkinsmith, did a carving on it on the stock for me. Really? And and it's a beautiful carving on there, eh? Right. Did uh, what what did that buck taste like? Taste like? Yeah. Well, how did he taste? You have to ask Jim Zumbo. He ate some of it. Oh yeah. Was it? Uh, you know you Jim eat, Zumbo. Did, yeah, I know. Uh, Jim, I know you're talking about. Sure. Yeah, actually, I took some of it down to the shot show in '94. Yeah. And um, and uh, outdoor life uh, had a little, you know, they cooked it and ate it. Yeah, it was good. He was he was really good eating. Yeah. yeah. So my he wasn't old beard, probably four and a half years old is what the biologist said. So it was only four and a half years old, and you developed a rack like that. What do you yeah. attribute that yeah. rack to? What was the reason that 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 uh, there was? Well, we had actually uh, uh, wet summers. And warm winters, you know, and he had the right mom and dad, and, uh, you know, he didn't get shot too early, and <clears throat> there was no damage on his horns growing him, eh? Hmm. Do so, you... I mean, it all it all had to come together, you know, not just one thing, but... I got a question he had the, for He had the right gene pool, the right father, and the right mother to, you know... Sure. Now, and the right growing seasons, you know, to get it that big, you know? When you were hunting that deer... And and I'm not sure what the mindset was or is where you where you are, but were you guys thinking world record at that point, or were you just thinking this is a big deer? I'd really like to have this deer. 
just a big deer. Even after I shot it, we brought it home and hung it up in our shop. And usually we eat our lunch out in the field, like, and have a cookout, you know, start a fire. Mm-hmm. But that day we just sat on benches and looked at it in the shop. Not one of us thought world record. Everybody said, holy man, I'm going to get the trophy in town this year. You know, <laughs> <laughs> not thinking past town. <laughs> and then a friend of mine, Adam Ivashenko, he was gone at the time. And actually, like, I missed some of the story because he actually seen it earlier in muzzleloader season. Mm. And uh, he went out and couldn't get a shot at it. But when I shot the deer, he was gone moose hunting up north. When he came back, he measured for our club here. Yeah. He measured it, and he said, you know, either I made a mistake or this is a new this is a world record. So at that time, I didn't even know what the world record was. So we went to Bruce Kushner's, and he had a book there, and we looked. And hmm. Yeah. So you guys were... 206 and 18, and this is the green score was 214 and 418. Eh? So you weren't really paying attention to records. Is that something that you that you that the group of you would pay attention to? Like, do you did no, you follow? No, no. It was okay. Basically, local. You know, you're just trying your, to uh, big buck night. Trying to that win the local deer pool. Went. It sounds like. Is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I mean, I didn't even know about the Jordan buck. Now I know lots about all that stuff. But, right. Interesting. Uh, no, we just didn't pay attention to that stuff. So, so you you sat around the camp at night and just you guys just kind of stared at it, huh? Well, yeah, yeah, hang hanging there, and then uh, the other guys wanted to go out, and I still had a doe tag, and we had doe tags at that time, so we went back out, and we met uh, Gerald Melstravage, and he'd been looking for this deer too, so we met him at our gate here to the west, about a mile from our place, and I said, you might as well go back to your own area, area Jerry, because I just shot that deer. He said, well, where is it? He looked in the back and said, well, it's in the shop. So we went on hunting, and he went to the shop, and then he went to town and told everybody. We came home. Here's a whole slug of half time sitting, looking around, <laughs> uh, you know, sitting in the shop looking at that deer. <laughs> yeah. uh, how many? And, uh... You know, we didn't even get a good field photo of it. I went and got the camera. I didn't realize the thing was empty, and I said I thought it said three, and I took pictures, but no film in the camera. <laughs> That's how nervous I was. <laughs> I'd say I'd say that's pretty nervous. Yeah. <laughs> what did Olive say? Well, right away she was excited, but you know, for the first three months, it was like a disaster in here. And she said, "I think I'll break this record with a hammer, pretty." <laughs> the phone wind kept ringing, people coming nonstop. You know, it it took a while to get used to this because we weren't used to you know all this uh, you know attention and. And I mean, yeah, it was. She was getting a little perturbed with it, yeah. But, Interesting. No, so she got over it. <laughs> so the, once the the word got out that there was a big deer shot in a bigger Saskatchewan, and that it might be the world record, things changed. In oh bigger. yeah, big time. Yeah. How did it change? What yeah, was now it like? There's a big statue of the deer outside of town. So there's a statue erected, and how did how did the the town adjust initially? I mean, so I'm sure things kind of settled down after a while, but what was mm. what was life like before and after? Yeah, well, actually, we had a meeting with the people in town, and uh, they were really good. And uh, actually, at the at the scoring day, we actually had it in the school auditorium at the 60 day dry down, and there was about 400 people there. Uh, there was our uh, our, our um, political representatives there, our president of our wildlife center. It was a big, big deal. Eh? And as they scored it, they had big four by eight sheets uh, on the wall made up like a score sheet, and they would write in the score, and everybody would clap. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah interesting. It was a big deal. Tell, tell us what the tine length, like the start like with the brow tines out to G two threes and going out. If, if you recall, Milo, what's the length on the tines? Yeah, the longest ones are fourteen inches. Uh, the brows, I think, are six, and uh, the beams are twenty seven, and the uh, inside spread is twenty seven and one eight. Outside spread is twenty nine. And I actually don't have a score sheet in front of me. <laughs> oh, you're doing good though. That that that's some that's some major major time length and, and some main beam yeah. length. Yeah. Uh, that that's a world and, record for and, sure. Yeah, and I think the circumference is he's a little light on there, but uh, they were five inches, and I think they came out to uh, you know four circumferences on each side around thirty six inches. Nice. Uh, this that's just an awesome rack. Now, where does the the mount rest today, Milo? Uh, in my little trophy room downstairs. 
And how many other? I still have it. Yeah. Oh, that's that's excellent. I would still have that too. Um, how many other yeah. <laughs> whitetails are hanging in the room with it? Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, and two mule deer. And then our shop out there, we got a bunch on the wall there, like just on boards and whatever. Gotcha. Nailed on the wall. Like. And this deer or this mount has been recreated how many times now? Uh, probably replicated probably around 50 times. Wow. wow. Yeah, like I sell them. I'm the only one that sells them. We're supposed to be selling them. And they get them made down the states. Tom, uh, Mike Gillis makes them in Wisconsin. Okay. And Tom Sexton paints them for me. Eh? Gotcha. Oh. And then I have a contract that, you know, whoever wants to buy it, uh, got to sign a contract. Yeah. That they, you know, won't replicate it. Or oh, I see. So you can get, you can have one replicated, but you won't replicate it after that. No, I don't want it to replicate after that. No. No, no. Of course not. You know, I have the copyright and trademark. I I got a legal trademark. Like it went through lawyers and all that stuff and got that done. Oh, interesting. Okay, so this not only has yeah. so the deer has gone from legend to trademark um, at this yeah, point. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Where did you check the buck in when you when you back in 1993? Oh, actually, like you don't have to check it in in Saskatchewan. Okay. Yeah, but like Adam Yushanko, the guy I told you about, he came over and measured it for our club. Okay. You know, we have a bigger wildlife federation club. Okay. And um, he came and measured it for our club, eh? So you didn't have to and check it. And then I took it to Sunnydale, Big Buck Night, and uh, a few other big nights, you know, Buck Nights. Sure. Gotcha. So yeah. there, And this word got around, you know, and there wasn't even email then or texting or nothing. It right. just went by phone. <laughs> So the word spread by phone back then. You're right. Everything was yeah. just a tethered cord. There was no cell phone. The internet was just no cell phone, no nothing. Not no. really no. doing email was not really being spread, but the word spread. So did you have like reporters coming in from all over the place to talk to you at that point? Oh yeah, we had uh, North American Whitetail come one day. Well, they had phoned us naturally. Sure. And Gordon Whittington and the owner then was Steve Vaughn flew in, and at the same time Jim Zumbo wanted the story for outdoor life. Right. So they uh, were forbidden against each other, and I didn't know there was a value in the story, but actually I got uh, $5,500 from North American Whitetail because they were sitting in our house. Wow. And Jim Zumbo said they wanted the second right to it, and I got 6000 for that. That's amazing. And I, I would have gave it away for nothing if there wouldn't have been two people wanting it at the same time. <laughs> right, right. Has your life changed any? It did. Now it's back to normal. Okay. I used to go for like two months at a time traveling with it. You know, the big outdoor sports shows would hire me to come and I'd be gone like two months at a time. And now I'm, I don't, I, you know, I don't go around showing it anymore. I've sold it to a few places where they can go and show it. Like uh, National Rifle Association has bought two. And in their displays, they go around showing. And the All Canada show, i sold them one and they have it at their shows. Gotcha. So, yeah. How old are you now, no, Milo? I'm 68. You're 68. Yeah. And do you, you still hunt today? I still hunt, yeah. yeah. Still do the same, still hunt with the same guy. Well, one of the guys here died a couple of years ago. He was 83 already. Gotcha. And do you have uh, uh, other generations that are following behind you? Uh, well, actually, my son hasn't hunted for a while because he was so busy, but his, his son is going to start hunting next year, so he's going to start up again, he said. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, the younger generations are so yeah. busy doing their own thing. That... Has the landscape of where you've hunted or where you took the big buck, has that been um, memorialized, or, or can you still hunt that area? Or how has the hunting changed since you shot the deer? I would imagine it got yeah. kind of popular. It actually, you know, never changed that much. At first, everybody was worried that everybody would come come into this area, and some people posted their land. I didn't. And uh, it never changed, really. See, an American can't hunt right here. He's going to be with an outfitter on the Forest Fringe, Crown Land. Okay. Or uh, actually just 20-some miles north of us is the Indian Reservation, so they can hunt in there, eh? But right around here, you know, the... Saskatchewan wildlife uh, rules is uh, you have to be with an uh, outfitter, right? Gotcha. So it's not like you can just go get a license and walk in there and start hunting. No, no, but Canadian can. And we had quite a few after a while, Canadians. Like I had a young guy from Quebec come up here hunting, just looking for trophy. Mm. They had some guys from BC and stuff, but they're all nice people, you know, really respectful. And... Yeah. 
What's uh, so it you, never changed really that much? The hunting pressure. Okay, so it, it, it hasn't changed much over the years. Um, no, do, not really. Do you ever hunt hunt the same spot where you where you harvested the world record? Oh, all the time it was on my land. Yeah. Gotcha. So you go back there. <laughs> I would too. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen yeah, where any... I shot that deer? Every time I, you know, that's a field next to it. Eh? I, I, it goes through my mind. You know, every time. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. So in your mind, as you're standing there hunting, every year since then, it probably you recreate the exact moment in your head. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Over and over. And, and over. you know, the size of it, like, I mean, I can't even explain the size of it, but you know, I've gotten excited and shot smaller deer mm-hmm. and just got so excited. I shot him and my wife said, how can you shot that? But you know, I did get excited and that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a 140 well, deer, you know. Why'd you shoot that small one, Milo? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're all, they're all trophies though. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you get excited, that's amazing. That's excellent. Um, now, does no. does Olive hunt with you, or is she a non-hunter? She used to hunt all the time, but then um, she quit, eh? Yeah. Gotcha. She, a couple of years ago, she went, we were gone for moose, and she went hunting moose, eh? It, See, we never used to have moose in this area, and now we got moose, you know? Oh, you can go out and hunt. What's that? So you've had moose move into the area since 1993? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's kind of new? moose yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't know what pushed them out. The fires in the north or the wolves. Hmm. And they're, they're just driving out in the agricultural land here because they got no uh, predators. You know, coyotes can't hurt them. The only thing that hurts them is uh, cars and trucks. Right. Is it affecting any of the browse for the deer or any of the, the food? I don't think so. No, they're loners, uh, moose, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're not in bunches, though. You know, you'd see one or two here and one or two there. Gotcha. Is there no, any... our biggest thing was our winter last year, right? Eh? Gotcha. Uh, it's it probably so, taking its so toll. Much way. Have you seen any other deer since 1993, any bucks that have come close to what you thought might be as big as the one that you shot? Yeah, no. Actually, the 1994, I shot another Boone Crockett. He grossed 187, netted 171 and 38. Wow. And, uh, yeah, yeah. He's like, so that, you know, on the bottom end of the scale, and the other one's at the top. <laughs> uh, you said in 94, so that's back-to-back Boone and Crockett, yeah. Boone and Crockett Whitetails. That's awesome. So you had a couple yeah, of pretty yeah, good years. Yeah, big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's been going downhill. It's been going downhill since then. Right? Gotcha. Um, yeah. now, what, uh, what do you have planned for this, this season? The, the come the next fall. Do you have? Do you, yeah. How, how does it? You, how do you usually set up? Do you do you start hanging out with your buddies and then start doing some scouting? Yeah, we do scouting. Like you know, you're farming this land, so you're scouting all the time, eh? And right, what right. we do now, we're all older. We got lot. We got stands all over, so we're doing a lot of stand hunting now, eh? Oh, interesting. So back, yeah, which we never did before, eh? We you know? used to do a lot of pushing back in the in the nineties. Pushing, 90s. yeah, yeah, yep, with yeah. Group, now, with, not too much. A little bit, if you know, you get in. If you see one and you can you know, figure you got to get it out of there. But most of the time, it's just stand hunting, you know? Okay. What kind of stands are you using? So, what's that? What kind of stands are you using? Uh, actually, i got a big homemade, uh, it, it's a ground one. It's a homemade one. It's 11 by 12. Hmm. And the table in there and the big wood burner. And, yeah, it's, it's not a, because, you know, the winter, you know, it can be 20 below when you're out there and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. But most of the guys got their own homemade stuff. Gotcha. Did, did, I, did I hear you say you got a wood burner in there, Milo? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, that's a nice stand. Yeah, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. It reminds me of some, we interviewed a fellow by the name of Dave Hoffman down in Pennsylvania who, who makes these giant, beautiful uh, deer stands in the trees. They're like tree houses. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So it so, sounds kind of like what you're doing there. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So yeah, what, I've got mine like all tin, uh, tin on the outside and tin roof, and then uh, all painted. You know, just insulated, double right. walled with insulation. Sounds like you need to have. So it's that. nice and warm in there. Heck yeah, that's awesome. Now, you can sleep in there, or whatever. Are you, have you adopted any? I mean, I see you're on Facebook, and I see mm-hmm. you know you, you've you probably have a cell phone. Do you find yourself trying to capture more hunting moments with some of the new technologies that are out there, like videotape and stuff like that? No, I never went there. No, I got, uh, uh, I got, uh, you know, those, uh, uh, Primo's cameras out, but yep. that's about as far as I went. Yeah. Gotcha. Have you ever, actually, I don't even carry a camera with me. <laughs> you don't. Okay. Well, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> and, and, yeah. yeah. Like we never did before. And, you know, I got, a. 
Well, you know what I'm talking to you right now? That's a cell phone. Eh? We don't have a landline. Okay, so you're on a cell yeah. phone right now. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Would you would you say that you're going to continue to hunt as long as you can? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I still enjoy it. So, and now that my grandsons are going to be starting and my son again, yeah, I'm going to probably do a lot more. Gotcha. Is there anything from that moment on that hunt in that day that you can remember that you haven't really shared um, with any of the other reporters? Mm. I've shared so much. <laughs> so much, yeah. Yeah, I, I can really tell you. Is, no, just, would you do it all again? For sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even though, you know, at first, I mean, it, it gets overwhelming. I mean, that phone would not quit ringing, you know. Mm. And all of it is good people phoning you, but then some people are trying to buy it, trade you trucks or whatever, and... You know, and at that time, I didn't even know why somebody would want to buy uh, another person's beer, you know. Mm. I didn't know there was a market out there like it is, you know. Mm. You didn't know what you I, had at that point. No, I well, I didn't know that, you know, you can market almost anything with this hunting stuff, you know. Right. No, I didn't know what I had, I guess, you know. So I had a long, a, a fast learning curve. I had to learn lots quick. I bet, I bet. So then I traveled probably for eight, ten years, you know, and then I quit. Wow. So you shoot one deer, your life changes completely, you travel for 18 years, yeah. and just now yeah. it's getting back to normal. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. But we know we still have lots of people phone or stop in. Or, uh, one year we had, I don't know how many people from Alaska stopping in, all of a sudden, where the hell's Alaska? What were the hell year? <laughs> <laughs> you know, people that had, uh, you know, were from the mainland United States and living in Alaska and they're going back to visit family and Right. They marked off bigger as they're driving. You know, they got Ross Street right through Saskatchewan. They stopped the end. Right. <laughs> uh, Dusty, what other questions do you have for Milo? Milo, tell tell us what your best memories of killing a world record buck. What what you're like your number one most memorable moment after you shot your buck? Oh boy, I mean, the most thing I was thinking about was just shaking. <laughs> you know? Right, but. but uh, it, Let's go. Let's go beyond that. Let's go to after you found out it was world record. What what was like one of the most unique things that happened because you shot the world record buck? Hmm. Some of the people I got to to meet, you know, like uh, Bill Jordan, David Bland, Gordon Whittington, Jim Zombo. You know, I, I met Larry Hoffman there. Uh, oh, you know, all these people that I met, eh? and they were all, you know, so intrigued with deer. Eh? Mm. Right, that's very cool. And, yeah. yeah, and some of the people I met. And I actually uh, ended up with some good friends that come hunting with us. He hasn't come for the last couple of years, but from uh, uh, New Brunswick, you know, and that's on the east, eastern part of the Canada. Eh? Right. And how right. I met him is we ended up at a snowstorm. We were going through uh, upper New York, and that snowstorm, ice storm hit that time, and all our hotels were uh, tied up by linemen, eh? So we had the, the, the hotel put a bunch of guys together, and I met him. Uh, and after that, he came here for ten years hunting with us. That's very cool, you know. That, that that's yeah. kind of what that's what it's all about is yeah, the adventure, yeah. the adventure, and the people. And yeah, you know, I'm gonna oh, tell you. Sure. I, I posted. Uh, Jay and I both have pages, and mine's Chubby Tines Outdoors on Facebook. And you can look me up and give me a like okay. if you would. But I posted that uh, that I'm interviewing Milo Hansen as I type this. And I put Big Buck Racer, Big Buck Podcast, and I hashtag World Record Buck. A guy from a, a guy from Kentucky says, "Tell him us guys here in Kentucky are still chasing the monster to knock him out of first place." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought that was yeah, pretty cool. Uh, that's the name of the game. Yeah. yeah, the guy's name was Eric Tangles. Eric, I posted it for you, buddy, and I told him, you know, and, and that is the name of the game. And Milo, what a great, great, great story, and we're very honored to have you on. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, Milo, we'd, uh, we'd s- sincerely appreciate you taking a, uh, some time out of your, your life to share the rest of the story of what happened back in 1993 and everything that's happened for you since then. It sounds like everything was positive, a bit overwhelming and maybe annoying at times, but it sounds like it was uh, overall an incredible positive experience. It was, yeah. No, uh, actually, I was sort of in a shell. Like, now I'm more outgoing, you know, so that helped. I mean, I could never be in front of a bunch of people or I've even, you know, did some kind of seminars there, you know, which I thought I could never do in my life. <laughs> sure. If you, had a, if you had a hunting tip that you would say 
you execute more frequently than anything else while you're hunting, um, what would that be? What I told you, my dad taught me, patience. Patience, know? patience, patience, yeah. patience. Um, I mean, that's what it takes. And how about I a mean, good... you've got to be in the right area and you got to do your scouting. You know, you got to right. find out what's in the area. But after that, I mean, you know, you just got to sit and wait. And would you say a good luck charm might be a good idea? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a big part. Of it. Gotcha. And I, I had one other yeah. last question uh, before we let you go, Milo. Um, yeah. it, it, back when you were, you were doing your deer drives in 93, um, I would assume that scent control wasn't a big deal uh, because you're pushing. You're trying to get the deer to pop out of an area into mm-hmm. another area. Yeah. D- yeah. These days, sounds like you're doing more stand hunting. Have you adopted any of the scent control type um, scents or things or concepts or just the mentality to try to keep your scent under control? No, not really. Okay. No. Wind, you know. Yep. Is a big thing, and that's what I wanted to hear. That's excellent. Yeah, excellent. Um, no, we don't have a lot of gadgetry. That those gadgetry companies go broke in Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's excellent. <laughs> oh man, that's hilarious. Um, mm. Dusty, you get anything, any last questions for Milo before we let him get back? No, I don't, Milo. Like I said, we we couldn't. We're really honored to have you on, and what a legendary buck that you've harvested. And you know, I'm definitely going to pass it on to my kids, grandkids, and there on after. Just just because it's uh, it's a unique story, and you sound like a great person. And like I said, me and Jay are very honored to have you on. Well, thanks for having me there, Dusty. You're very welcome. Thank you, Milo. I appreciate it, and. Uh, We'll we'll send you a link when the show's out, and uh, hopefully hopefully you'll enjoy it, and maybe we can have you back on again. Sure, sure, yeah, no problem. Very cool, uh, Dusty. Oh uh, man, th- th- we may have to take like a minute pause, dude. I'm kind of shaking. I think I need a moment. <laughs> oh my god, we just interviewed and got the story on the Milo Hansel buck. Yep, the story's been told a million times. The story's been rewritten a million times. The story's been. The deer itself has been recreated a million times. Well, 50, technically, according to Milo. Right. But I don't think Milo has ever been on a buck or a podcast, period, that I'm aware of. He did, Until now. And if you listen closely at the end, he didn't know exactly what a podcast was. So we've got to be the first. This is legendary. With a legendary buck, a legendary gentleman, Milo Hanson, thank you, sir. Thank you. Milo Hansen. And this is historical, Dusty. This might have been the first podcast that Milo Hansen has ever been interviewed on. That's awesome. It, it, you know, that it, it only happens on the Big Buck Race or Big Buck Podcast. We, that's what we're here for. We're mm-hmm. here to get great, legendary Big Buck stories like Milo Hansen and the Hansen Buck. 1993, world record, typical Boone and Crockett, 213 and 5 eighths inches. Right. It doesn't get no better than this. And we're doing it for... Well, I'm a little selfish about this one, uh, I'll admit, but I'm doing it for you, the per- the person that is sitting in the chair, driving his car, driving her car, out to the tree stand, to work, wherever you're listening to this, on your computer, on your headset, your earphones, on your iPhone, wherever. We're doing this for you. If you're a hunter, you have to appreciate this show. If and, you're a hunter, this this is the one that you don't want to miss. Right. Milo Hansen is 68 years old. Is that correct? Uh, born in 1945. Yeah, I think he's 68 is what he said. And uh, we've captured his voice forever as we, are, as, as we have vowed to do to protect the story, sport, and spirit of big buck deer hunting. That was it. It, it don't get no better, Jay. No. You know, I, I'm honored to be sitting here with you and to be able to say that we just got off the phone with legendary Milo Hansen. There isn't a per- there isn't a hunter in the United States or Canada that hasn't heard about this deer. Absolutely, and we we talked to him. We talked to Milo Hansen. We we just did. I mean, I, I'm so pumped. You know that it just happened. <laughs> it did. It, it did just happen. I can't even talk right now. I'm so jacked up about it. <laughs> so crazy. But you know that that's the Big Buck Registry right there. You know the Big Buck Podcast. That's what we're here for right and stories like that and i have to say dusty kudos to you because you took that legendary bloodhound killer instinct of yours 
and you went and found Milo and picked up the phone without any inhibitions and got him on the phone to say, hey, Milo, would you be on our show? I did, you know, and, and I did it for for us being selfish, me and you, mm-hmm. and also I definitely want our listeners to be able to hear Milo Hansen's yeah. story. Yeah, and that's what it's all about, to record and protect and preserve those stories as you're hearing here today. Wow. <laughs> Double wow. Wow, Double. wow, wow. Unbelievable. <laughs> it I, was awesome, man. You I, know, uh, I can't be more thrilled for, for our listeners and, and for us and the Big Buck Race, your Big Buck podcast. It just, you know, it, this is one awesome moment right here for us. Yeah. If we've never, if we never do another show again, I'm okay. <laughs> I, I have to agree to that. Yeah. But, but, you know, that just, it just drives us to, to go do more podcasts, you know, because it yeah. just, find more unique stories like Milo's yep. and you know that that's what drives us that's yep. what keeps us going and we're going to keep going there's no stopping here I love listening to Milo he has a, a great Canadian accent and he was more than willing to tell a story and to think that he first told his story for $6,500 a, a pop and and he, he just did it for free for us yeah and and thanks again Milo we really yes. do appreciate it thank you Milo uh, just amazing um, Dusty that that is that's all the show I've got in me today. I think I'm done too. I I'm just done. Gotta, I'm ready to get off here and sit in my office chair in the studio and and just soak all this in that we just got off the phone with Milo Hansen and what a great story, what yep. a great guy. I'm gonna uh, uh, I'm gonna send you the unedited MP3 when we're done. Yeah, I definitely want that. You need and, that. Uh, you know, I'm going out like this. I'm Dusty Phillips with Chubby Times Outdoors. I am so jacked up. We just talked to Milo Hansen. I got to get off here and so far this in. Jay, tell us about you. All right, man. Um, oh, I'm just pumped up. Uh, Jay Scott, Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast. Uh, you can find us on Facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. You will hear this show with 8 million links on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, we'll send links to the show on iTunes and Stitcher and Blueberry. Um, you go, you'll be able to Google it, and it'll be Milo Hansen, the the story of the Milo Hansen buck told by Milo Hansen, uh, and you will find it. And oh, I'm just, uh, I'm still pumped up, but send, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> send me an email if you want, J at BigBuckRegistry.com. Uh, you can always call us, call the show, and please leave us some feedback about this show. Because this is a big one. 724-613-2825. And, man, I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. It's the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.